Hey guys, welcome back to Intelligent Faith 315. This is Pastor Jay. So good to be with you today. As you can see behind me today, we're continuing on in our lesson, Has Science Eliminated the Need for God? Today is part seven of our series that should be our last lesson. I really do encourage you to go over uh, the other episodes that we've covered, episodes one through six. And also, uh, if you are watching us on YouTube, do encourage you to open up another tab in your browser. Go to our mother website, intelligentfaith315.com. Uh, we talk about other topics like this, evidence for God's existence, uh, and lots of proof and evidence for the truth of the Christian worldview. So I do encourage you to go check that out, intelligentfaith315.com, whether you are a skeptic or whether you are a believer, uh, so you can see the evidence for the truth claims of the Christian worldview. Also, you can go to iTunes and you can download our podcast, Reason to Believe. That's Reason in the singular, Reason to Believe podcast on iTunes. Uh, lots of good notes for you there. There's about 35 episodes or so. And if you are on the website watching this, I encourage you to go over to our YouTube channel and you can get all of our video content in uh, one glance. As I said, has science eliminated the need for God? This is uh, part seven in this series. Let me just review what we've covered up thus far and then we'll be finishing out this lesson today. If you remember, there's five reasons or five points that we were making, five different reasons why we are contending, we are... are uh, taking the position that science has not eliminated the need for God. There's five reasons why we're making that claim. Number one, as you can see behind me, is the scientific founding fathers. These men were largely Christians and theists. Reason number two is that scientism is a self-defeating idea. Number three, 95% uh, of science has simple irrelevance to Christianity. It doesn't have a lot to do with the uh, metaphysical or religious truth claims of the Christian faith. However, number four, there is strong support. 5% of science is very relevant to the truth claims of the Christian faith. And then number five today, there is a single perspective. Science is only a single perspective. It is one of many ways uh, to obtain truth and knowledge about reality. So some of the guys that we covered, uh, we talked about Plato and Aristotle, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Nicholas Copernicus, Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton, Louis Pasteur, Francis Bacon, Johannes Kepler, Robert Boyle, James Clark Maxwell, Michael Faraday, Baron Kelvin, and of course Albert Einstein. And all of these gentlemen, as we said in our previous episodes, uh, were Christians, or in the case of Albert Einstein, he was a deist, a believer in a creator God. And we are simply making the contention, and do encourage you to watch, I think, the three episodes on those scientific founding fathers, simply making the contention that Science is not um, contradictory, but rather complementary. These gentlemen did not see a conflict between uh, scientific research and their philosophical religious uh, investigation into the existence of God. They, they saw one complementing the other. And so I do encourage you to watch over those episodes and do some reading on the lives of these men. And if, there's, if it's a good biography, it's going to give you some insight into their scientific but also their spiritual background uh, from the Christian worldview as well. A good book on this is Men of Science, Men of God by Dr. Henry Morris. The second reason that we covered is that scientism is a self-defeating idea. Uh, this idea states, as you remember, only those things which can be proven by scientific methods are true, and it contradicts its own standard. In other words, we talked about the fact that scientism is making a claim that it cannot live up to, that only truth claims, which are expressible in the language of science, namely physics or chemistry, are meaningful and should be accepted. Unless a truth claim is true by definition or it is verifiable through scientific methods, it's meaningless. But you see, unfortunately, uh, this truth claim cannot be verified through the scientific method, through the language of physics or chemistry, and it's certainly not true by definition. So the claim of scientism is absolutely self-contradictory, it's self-stultifying, and it's self-defeating. Um, we talked about the philosophical positions of verificationism and logical positivism. And do some research on those. Those were philosophical positions taken that are very similar to scientism, and they were defeated in the academic arena because in the middle of the 19th century, I'm sorry, middle of the 20th century, the 1900s, 1950s, in the middle of the 20th century, it was understood that this type of an idea 
about scientific understanding is self-contradictory. And so verificationism was abandoned. And so scientism is basically verificationism wrapped up in a new lab coat. And scientism is a self-defeating idea. This is not science. Science comes from the Latin word scientia, which means knowledge. But scientism is this idea that uh, only scientific knowledge about reality is trustable, trustworthy, and meaningful, but it's a self-contradictory, self-stultifying idea. That was reason number two, that science has not eliminated the need for God. We talked about that. Also, we talked about reason number three, that 95% of uh, scientific claims, research, and so forth are irrelevant, in a sense, to belief in God. I mean, one sense, if God exists, which of course he does, then all scientific understanding and so forth can be connected. But in a sense, you can do science in a lot of different areas and uh, disciplines, and it doesn't affect, let's say, the doctrinal or the, or the religious truth claims of the Christian worldview. So most scientific discoveries have little to do with belief in God. And we talked about, for example, the structure of a water molecule, the photosynthetic process, animal cells, and the number of nucleotides in the DNA molecule. Though these things are important, and in a lot of cases, I think can give a lot of input in terms of intelligent design inference and so forth, but in and of themselves, they are pretty much irrelevant uh, to the truth claims of the Christian faith, whether the doctrine of atonement or substitution is true, whether the incarnation is true, etc. And so that's an interesting point to take into consideration that about 95% of scientific discoveries and uh, truth claims don't really overlap with the Christian faith. That was reason number three. Reason number four, why we are, are claiming that science has not eliminated the need for God, is that about 5% of science is relevant to belief in God, but this about 5% of so uh, overlapping with the truth claims of the Christian faith is strongly supportive of a lot of the truth claims and ideas and beliefs of the Christian worldview. For example, we covered three we talked about, number one, Einstein's equation, of course, E equals MC squared. We talked about that the, one of the many things that you can learn from this equation, E equals MC squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, is that the universe had a point of beginning a finite time ago out of absolute nothingness. And so this demands, of course, a beginner. It, it demands a cause for the effect of the universe. This means the universe is not static. It is not eternal, as Einstein himself at one time believed, but rather the universe needs a cause. Uh, even if you believe in the uh, multiverse theory, the bord guth vilenkin theory of 2003 states that any universe, which, which on the average of its history has been expanding, needs a point of beginning and can only be finite into the limited past. And so E equals MC squared, Einstein's equation, is evidence number one uh, that it does support the truth claims that the universe did begin out of nothingness by God. Because, of course, the only other options would be the universe is eternal, which this is disproven by uh, Einstein's equation, that the universe was self-caused, uh, that is logically incoherent and contradictory, or that the universe uh, came out of nothingness all by itself. Uh, and we don't even know how that would happen, and that also is logically incoherent. So the only logical and feasible option that's left open to us, and the only option that is verified by the mathematics and the science, is that there was a cause to the effect of the universe. And of course, um, to be the cause of all time, space, matter, and energy, of course the only um, contender that would fit that, that description would be a being such as God. So uh, evidence, Einstein's equation is good scientific evidence that supports the truth claims of Genesis 1-1, for example, that in the beginning God created out of nothingness uh, the heavens and the earth. As Christian doctrine has always classically said, ex nihilo, out of nothingness. The second one that we looked at was Hubble's observations. In 1929, at the Mount Wilson Observatory using this telescope, Edwin Hubble, he realized that the light coming from distant galaxies was redshifted, and he basically uh, established this scientific fact that the universe is expanding away from a point of common origin. Albert Einstein uh, met up with Dr. Edwin Hubble. They collaborated, and of course, this has led to the idea of the expansion of the universe uh, has contributed to the understanding of the Big Bang model and of current cosmology. And so if you take the expanding universe and run it in reverse, of course, 
it goes back into a point of infinite density and dimensionless space, okay, which is a scientific way of saying absolute nothingness, infinite density and dimensionless space. And so, again, you're faced with the same metaphysical dilemma. The science will bring us so far, but then once we arrive back at this kind of event horizon and it, and it comes down to nothingness, this singularity, this point of infinite density and dimensionless space, it demands a beginner. Uh, everything cannot come out of nothing, so there must be a cause to this very huge effect of the universe. And again, Hubble's observations, the expanding universe, uh, points back to the need for a cause, the need for a beginner, the need for an originator of all of the space-time physical universe that we observe. So his scientific claim is also heavily supportive of the truth claims of the Christian worldview. And then number three that we looked at, extremely interesting and extremely supportive, is universal fine-tuning. If you are an atheist or a secularist or a humanist watching this, you must understand that universal fine-tuning is a fact. It is not something that Christians are coming up with. Um, if, you, if you're not aware that this is a fact, then you really do need to do a little bit more research. Many atheist cosmologists, astrophysicists, and astronomers are very troubled by universal fine-tuning because they understand uh, that it, it gives the tremendous inference to a designer because of the fine-tuning. The fine-tuning implies a fine-tuner. And so again, if you look at things like the cosmological constant, which is the expansion rate of the uh, universe, the electromagnetic force, gravitational force, strong and weak nuclear force, speed of light, mass of a proton, charge of an electron, and many, many other constants of nature. There's about 30 or so. And we have realized that each of these individual constants is fine-tuned down to millionth of millionth parts of precision in and of themselves. But then the even more fascinating thing to realize is that each of these constants is fine-tuned in ratio to one another. And so that if, if any one of them were to be altered in the slightest sense, complex conscious observers never would have made an appearance in the universe. Complex life would be impossible. And so universal fine-tuning uh, is a tremendous uh, supportive piece of scientific evidence that goes with the truth claims of the Christian worldview. And many people say that we do live in a Goldilocks universe. Just as Goldilocks found the porridge that was just right for her, our universe does seem to be just right for the appearance of complex life and conscious observers. And of course, many of you might appeal to the multiverse, but there is no independent scientific evidence for the multiverse, nor could there ever be. And so number one, there's no scientific evidence for that. If you hold it, that is a philosophical position. But if you are a scientific, reasoning, logical person, the empirical evidence of fine-tuning points to a fine-tuner, to a designer. And so uh, that is very interesting. And again, this scientific research is supportive of the truth claims of the Christian worldview. We went through a bunch of quotes uh, by numerous physicists, astronomers, and astrophysicists here that, that do support this idea of a fine-tuner, a designer of the universe. And today, finally, in our last episode, we come to reason number five why science has not eliminated the need for God. And it's very simple. Science is just one way of discovering the truth about reality. So this, in our outline, was the last one, a single perspective. Science is a good perspective. It is an important perspective to have and to take, but it is only a single perspective about obtaining knowledge and truth about reality and the universe. So there are many other methods besides science for learning and discovering the truth about life, reality, and existence. So science is one avenue of truth, and science is extremely important. Actually, we made the contention in our video series, and there's many, many good books about this, uh, certainly guys who are a lot more intelligent than I am, that the modern scientific enterprise was birthed in a Christian culture, and as we have made the contention, it was upheld largely by Christian thinkers and scientists. So science is, of course, very important, and if you are a Christian, then you must realize that there is no conflict between science and the Christian worldview. There's no conflict between uh, scientific reasoning and scriptural understanding. There is no conflict there whatsoever. And so that's important for you to realize. So Christians should love science, should encourage science, and should be engaged in science. So you need to know that if you're an atheist, a secularist, a humanist, 
An intelligent, well-researched Christian will hold to that opinion, as did the scientific founding fathers who were themselves great Christians. As we said, Isaac Newton, Louis Pasteur, Michael Faraday, etc. However, though science is only... Uh, although science is a, a great reliable source, it's only one of many avenues. What would some of the other ways be? You watching this video, you do not only go through life um, looking at things in a scientific perspective. You also look at the world in some of these ways. You also, watching this video, I'm sure you believe in aesthetic truth. In other words, beauty. So aesthetics is something that people do perceive and do believe in. And so uh, this aspect of beauty, this is a realm of perceiving truth. Now, of course, many of you are thinking that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and I really don't think that to be true at all. If beauty does exist at all, it needs to be an absolute quality. Now, your perception of beauty, that in and of itself can be relative, but aesthetically, if beauty exists, it is an absolute quality. And of course, from the Christian worldview, we do believe that beauty is anchored in the absolute character of God himself. But nonetheless, aesthetic truth, truth about beauty, when you see a painting or you see a, a beautiful person or you, or you witness a beautiful event, if you do believe in the concept of beauty, beauty, aesthetic truth, is not something that can be quantified scientifically, but it is something that we believe to be true about reality. Another area of truth is conceptual truth. These are ideas. This is something that scientists assume to be true, that conceptual truth, propositional truth does exist. The conceptual truths of science, the propositional truths about scientific research. However, ideas, of course, cannot be bottled up and quantified by physics or biology or so forth. So you have to realize that science, the scientific enterprise, is only one of many areas of truth but science itself is like a table, and, and the legs of the table that science is supported by, this would be one of them. Conceptual truth and ideas. Science depends upon certain assumptions, and we're going to make another video about this uh, pretty soon. It's probably going to be our next video. The assumptions of science. One of the assumptions of science is that conceptual truth ideas exist, and they, they can be relied upon. And so this is another area of truth, conceptual truth that we do believe to be true, and we even harness it and use it in the scientific uh, enterprise and investigation. Aesthetic truth, conceptual truth, what about moral truth? Surely, even if you're a scientist, even if you're an atheist, even if you're a moral relativist or a moral nihilist, you as a scientist believe that there are right and wrong ways of doing scientific research. You do believe there are right and wrong ways of giving scientific credit for work or theories that have been done or published. And so all of us really do believe in one way or another, even if you claim to be a moral skeptic, moral relativist, moral nihilist, we do believe in some way, shape, or form in absolute moral values. But moral truth is another area of truth that we do believe in, but it cannot be investigated through the tools of scientific empirical study, physics, biology, chemistry, etc. But we do believe in moral truth. So aesthetic truth, conceptual truth, moral truth. Also, how about memory truth? We do believe in our memories. As a scientist, when you go into the laboratory, even the scientist will believe in what he did his research on in the prior day. Even if there's no notes, even if there's no recordings of it or or, or data that log the results, he will believe in his mind of the memories taking place. So memory truth, our past, we believe our memories to be true. But again, this is not open to scientific investigation. Of course, there's neural activity and so forth that happens when people have memories, when MRIs or CAT scans are done, but memories in and of themselves are not quantifiable. You cannot bottle them up and uh, put them in the microscope or in a Petri dish, but yet we do believe in memory truth. Oh, what about minds? Do we believe that minds exist? Many of you would claim not to be. You, you might be a physicalist or a materialist. Uh, you wouldn't consider yourself an anthropological dualist, meaning that there are two aspects to humanity. There is the physical and there is the, oh, I guess you could say the spiritual or the soulish, the mind. But most people do believe that minds do exist. 
And so if you do happen to believe in a mind, in consciousness, and of course if you don't believe in it, uh, you are consciously not believing in consciousness, which is self-defeating, but most people do believe in minds, that we have minds and that other people have minds, but minds in and of themselves, not brains. Brains are open to scientific inquiry and investigation, but minds, which would be the software that runs the hardware, are not open to that. What about mathematical and logical truth? If you're a scientist, you obviously believe in mathematical reasoning. Many of you use it every day. The laws of mathematics, the axioms and principles of mathematics, these are not uh, physical material objects, again, that you can quantify in a petri dish or in a lab, but we do believe in them. And logical truth as well, the laws of logic. And again, we're going to elaborate on this in the future. These are assumptions that the scientist makes before he steps into his laboratory, that mathematical and logical truths exist. Where do they come from? Who invented them? We didn't invent them. We actually discovered them. But how do they exist? They are not physical. They are not material. And they, they don't fall into the realm of scientific empirical study. But yet we do believe in mathematical and logical truths. And we also believe in certain emotional truths, such as love. And if you're a moral nihilist or a moral relativist, I just ask you, is there anybody in your life that you would say that you do love? Well, uh, there are chemical reactions that happen in the brain and in the body when we do love people. But love in and of itself is not a chemical. It is not a gene. And it is not open. Love in and of itself is not quantifiable. It is not able to be put into a Petri dish or into a test tube. It's not really analyzable through the language of physics or biology. So these are different areas of truth. These are other ways of truth that we do learn reliable information about reality, about life, about the cosmos. Again, we have aesthetic truth, conceptual truth, moral truth, memory truth, truth about minds, mathematical and logical truth, and emotional truth. These are many different areas that are not contained within the scientific realm of investigation, but we do believe in them. That is our fifth reason why science has not eliminated the need for God, because science depends upon many of these areas of truth and assumes them to be true before we begin scientific investigation. So that's our fifth reason. Again, the scientific founding fathers were mostly largely Christians and theists, Number two, scientism is a self-defeating idea that fails its own test. Uh, simple irrelevance, number three, 95% of science has nothing to do with the truth claims of the Christian worldview and faith. Number four, 5% of relevant, relevant science gives strong support to the Christian worldview. And five, science is a single perspective, one of many ways that we can learn truth about reality. We shouldn't eliminate science. It's a wonderful, reliable tool although it's based on probabilities and inductive reasoning, but we should also not eliminate the other uh, areas and, and methods of obtaining truth about reality. So uh, if you are a follower of Christ, if you're a Christian believer, how can this help you? Well, uh, you should love and study God's word, the scriptures. You should love and study God's world, the sciences. And you should love and share with unbelievers uh, someone you know. This is great information for you as a follower of Christ, as a believer in the Christian worldview. You can trust your Bible, trust the scriptures. You should also trust and love science in as far as it is good science, and you should share this information with others. If you are not a Christian, if you are not a, a theist watching this, then this is what I would encourage you. As a person who is still seeking truth, investigate the amazing evidence for the existence of God, for the truth claims of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, the philosophical evidence, the archaeological, the scientific evidence. Go to our website, intelligentfaith315.com, and, and watch the videos and the articles. And, and go to some great thinkers like Dr. William Lane Craig, Dr. Gary Habermas, Dr. Norman Geisler. Uh, there is amazing evidence for the Christian worldview, ladies and gentlemen. We do not believe in Christianity, in the Christian worldview, on the basis of feelings, rather on the basis of facts. Um, and then make an honest, informed decision for yourself. I do encourage you, don't just have presumptions or assumptions about your worldview. You need to be honest and examine the evidence. 
Uh, I didn't always used to be a Christian. I've only been a Christian for about 15 years or so. After, after making a rigorous two-year investigation of the Bible, of the scriptures, of the philosophical, historical, archaeological, scientific uh, truth claims, or the evidence for the truth claims of the Christian worldview, after a rigorous two-year investigation, that is when I committed my life to Christ. Because that's where the evidence leads. All the other world religions and the, the perspectives, the world views, they have huge logical and evidential problems. And the only one that stands up to the test is the Christian worldview. So I do encourage you to check that out. And uh, we're going to continue on uh, with some other series. We're going to do a couple more videos about science and the Christian worldview. I encourage you to come back and join us for those. Uh, we'll see you around. Thank you.